For this episode of Coffee with Closers, I'm sitting down with Chaz Thorne. Chaz has over two decades of experience building companies in entertainment, management consulting, and agricultural technology. He's an award-winning filmmaker whose films have been screened at the Toronto International Film Festival. Academically, Chaz has studied as a classical actor at the National Theatre School of Canada and received his MBA from the Kellogg School of Management. During our conversation, Chaz talks about the importance of strategic planning and practical advice on how to execute the plans to achieve the corporate objectives. Stay tuned for my conversation with Chaz Thorne. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Chas, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. I'm very happy to be here, Samuel. Yes, I'm most, uh, most certainly excited, to, uh, excited for our conversation. So obviously, Chas, every entrepreneur has a, a story of how they overcame obstacles to become an entrepreneur. I'm sure you had some fair share of your own uh, struggles and, uh, and things that led you to be an entrepreneur. Can you share a little bit to our audience what led you to become an entrepreneur? Well, I suppose my story is a little bit different in that I've never had a job. Uh So I've only ever been an entrepreneur. Um, uh, I have been an entrepreneur for 30 years now. Um, I started when I was 15 years old, so I'll leave that to you to do the math in terms of what that means my age is. And I, um, what was very different though about my path is um, I started as an artist. So at 15, I started as a professional actor. And that is then what I went and, and studied to do. Um, and uh, for the majority of my career, uh, the companies that I owned and the pursuits that I undertook were uh, artistic in nature. And, and the the largest one being um, that I, I owned a film production company where I wrote, directed, and produced quite large theatrical feature films. So the transition into the work that I do now as a competitive strategist really came from acknowledging the transferable skills that I had built up uh, during my career and then me being exposed to especially some a few very special people at at business school uh, where I went for my MBA later in life, that really caused me to fall in love with competitive strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was kind of what I was going to lead you to. You you touched on is because you're uh, an actor who turned an entre- entrepreneur is a very unique. Uh, makeup, right? And you have that creative side and now the strategic side. So, and also to your name, there's a lot of credentials that you touched on the MBA. You went to Kellogg Business School, uh, Northwestern, you have an MBA there. You have, like you said, you trained actor, you have certified business coach. Uh, you also have a certified uh, sales training. There's a whole lot of credentials and obviously you've founded several companies before. Uh, now you have written recently a book on uh, one page strategic planning. So, so many things you've accomplished in your life. Uh, of all the things you, you would say you accomplished, what's the one thing that you're super proud of? Oh, wow. <laughs> I would say the, the thing that I'm most proud of is being able to transition out of a focus on um, a fairly strict focus on artistic pursuits to the type of work that I do now. Um, that wasn't easy. Uh, it, it wasn't easy, not so much in terms of my own, um, my own skills, expertise, training, all of those things I was I either already had or, or was able to develop. Um, it was mostly about how I approached those conversations and how I approached telling that that story of why I do what mm-hmm. I what I do now. Um, it was difficult. It was really, really difficult. It was definitely not 
it would me going from being um, a successful um, film uh, producer and director to being a competitive strategist. Uh, it was not a smooth transition. It was very, very challenging. As I said, it, it required me going back to uh, school. Um, it required uh, a real shift of my own mindset. Um, and uh, and it also just was very tactically challenging in terms of uh, even just moving to doing something different for a living in terms of the effect that that had on my income, because I was reinventing myself, I really had to take a pretty significant step back for a few years and, and rebuild. But mm -hmm. here I am now. I love, I love what I do. And I think that's the, I think that's the transformation that I'm most proud of. Mm -hmm. You kind of made a good segue for me, which is my question of why, right? Because every entrepreneur has a reason why they do what they do. And what is that why that keeps your drive and keeps you motivated? I think the, the main thing that got me hyper-focused on uh, strategic planning was that it was something that I was naturally just very good at. Um, I am someone who tends to think in process. I am someone who plans, um, and the the why really emerged out of in the early days when I first started, you know, acting as as really a, a kind of a management consulting generalist. I saw how badly it was done, typically, and. By bad, I mean normally the process was uh, really arduous for the people that undertook it. Um, they found that it it was just a PR exercise or was a waste of their time and didn't have anything to do with their real work. Mm -hmm. It oftentimes took a very long time and it was um, uh, also very, very expensive. And I saw, just frankly, not to be overdramatic, but the pain that it caused in organizations because they either did not have a plan or how they went about creating it was so flawed that they had something that was just woefully ineffective. And as, as a result, you ended up with an organization that was just completely out of alignment. People didn't understand why they were doing their work day to day. They were oftentimes very disengaged. Um, they oftentimes didn't feel valued. Um, they didn't understand their own why of why they were doing the things that they were doing and were struggling to maintain motivation. And from a leadership perspective, I watched leaders really, really struggle with communicating to their teams. So that made me go, okay, there has to be a better way to do this work. Mm -hmm. Which is a good segue into my, uh, my the, the meat of the discussion today because you have written this book on this one page strategic planning and you've also had some resources around that, the whole concept. So can you elaborate a little bit about this methodology that you came up with? Um, and it's a, it's a process that you facilitate organizations to go through. Well, one page plans at at a larger level is a belief in always taking a one page approach to any type of plan, whether it be sales, marketing, communications, crisis management, doesn't matter. The specific methodology that we practice and developed over the past six years that is focused on enterprise strategic planning, what we classically call strategic planning, is called the Lighthouse Methodology. And really it's, it's built to look like a lighthouse. Um, at the very top of it sits something called a guiding light. And then the other levels of it are all about uh, creating alignment throughout an organization. We do it in only two days uh, virtually. 
with our clients. We've done it with startups all the way up to $8 billion a year public companies and also from nonprofits that were 150K a year up to 180 million a year. And the process is always pretty much the same. And what it is, is really about capturing the entire uh, vision of where you are, where you want to go, and how you will get there on a single page. And by doing that, by making it concise and very clear, it can also double as a management system. So it's a tool that you use absolutely every day that guides your daily decision making throughout the organization. So that's really the magic in it, because it's not a lot of blah, 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 which is what we we typically see. It can sit on one page. It can be iterated on uh, very frequently. Strategic planning should not be done as, as uh, set it and forget it. It's something that you need to come back to on a regular basis. And it's also something that people can hold in their in their heads. That's the beauty of keeping it so simple and concise. Yeah. So I know in your, you know, the framework you have, the guiding light, the values, the focus area and the barometers, right? So, I mean, you mentioned that it could be for the company as a whole, or it could also be more of a one page strategic plan for the sales organization. So I'm assuming this could be apl- applied to any, any function of a business. It can. Um, mm-hmm. We all we all need to be operating strategically. And the, w- sometimes what we do is when we're working with, especially a very large organization, um, we may do the enterprise level strategic planning and then uh, move off and, and then have that inform the work that we would do with a specific functional unit, say sales, marketing, operations, finance. Um, But again, it always comes back to whether it's a unit, whether it's a small company, a large company, uh, is maintaining that alignment throughout so that everyone is using the same language, everyone is rowing in the same direction, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on a little bit in terms of how do you leverage this to make sure uh, making business decisions? So once you have this one-page strategic planning uh, document, How does that actually guide your decision-making process? What to do or what not to do? Well, I mean, you actually just said it Mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. That strategy is as much about what you're going to do as what you're not going to do. Mm -hmm. And what what I've seen very, very often, particularly from people that, you know, are in the space that I'm in, that are strategists and and do this kind of work is um, they tend to uh, they tend to overcomplicate or uh, try to oversexify strategy, if you will. Um, strategy is very simple at its core. It is about making choices, and whether it's in conversations with a client or in conversations with um, with my students, I, I teach uh, strategy at Dalhousie University. Um, I always emphasize that first and foremost, that that is what strategy is. And some people will argue that that is overly simplified. Mm-hmm. But I have seen that complication is at the core of why most strategic planning processes and why most strategic plans do not work. Mm -hmm. So if you present me, uh, so if I come into a client and uh, they're like, okay, we, we've decided that we want to work with you. We like your methodology. um, And they send me their previous strategic plan. Um, If I, one, if it's very, very long, or if I see that there are, 12 values and 16 strategic imperatives and 386 KPIs. And I know that they've basically violated that foundational rule of strategy is about choices. What they've done is they've they've treated strategic planning 
as an internal PR exercise, which means that they're, they're trying to make everyone happy and they're trying to avoid making decisions. And you see, the, you see this a lot. And I think a, a big reason for that is oftentimes, um, especially in larger organizations, you get CYA syndrome or cover your ass syndrome. Hmm. So you try to shove all of these different things in uh, to make everyone happy. Um, and as a result, really what you've done is you have made no choices. So this is not a strategic plan. It's just some kind of academic exercise that your organization has undertaken that likely has not gotten any results. Mm -hmm. So I think starting from that place of recognizing that, no, actually, you only get three to five values, for example. So if you go beyond three to five, every single additional value that you add to that list diminishes the collective usefulness of all of your values. And to make it even more concise, if you can't hold the top three levels of your lighthouse, which would be your guiding light, your values, and your focus areas in your head, they are not affecting your day-to-day -day behavior and therefore they're useless. And you can only do that by making tough choices about what you will do and what you will not do. Mm -hmm. So obviously a strategy without execution is, is just basically a, a dream, a list of a bunch of dream ideas, right? So what, what practical advice do you have for organizations, especially having maybe even have gone through your program or maybe even following something like traction or scaling up or any of those uh, syst you know, methodology they may follow? Like how do they actually go about executing it and making sure that they're sticking to that strategic document they have put together? Um. I would, I would uh, focus on two principles there. Mm -hmm. one, is that, uh, one is that you are ensuring that whatever your strategic choices are, that you have driven them down through the tactical levels, down to everyday tasks. That is the phone calls that need to be made, the emails that need to be sent, the floors that need to be cleaned, the widgets that need to be built, all of that stuff at the, at the smallest, smallest level. Mm -hmm. Everyone in your organization should understand how their smallest task connects all the way back up to your largest aspirations in mm -hmm. terms of who you want to be as an organization. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, um, the first thing is making sure that there's that connection all the way through. The other is that you come back to it on at least a monthly basis so that it's not a document that sits on a, a shelf. It is a living and breathing tool that as you move forward, as you discover things while you're moving through implementation, you're constantly coming back to your plan and going, how did that go? Do we need to maybe change our focus areas? Are we actually living our values in terms of the how of how we're, we're doing our work? Are some of what we call barometers, other people would call them metrics or KPIs, what have you, um, are, they, are we actually achieving them? Are we, are we off in terms of, uh, of the whens of, of when we expected to achieve certain, um, certain metrics and, and results, but making sure that you always come back to it, that it's not just treated as this obligatory exercise that we just have to do every 12 months. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on the, the, the simple task breakdown, right? So you have the strategic plan, so you have some big uh, ambitious goals, right? And you've made some strategic decisions on what you're gonna do, what you're not gonna do. And let's just say if it's around maybe just the sales or revenue targets or something like that. And then within this document, are you going to be documenting the subtasks that has to get done? Well, the number of uh, you know opportunities that we need to create or the market that we're going to penetrate. How does that, uh, in terms of uh, documenting that, where, where would that go? 
Well, the way that the lighthouse works, it's it's a lot easier when you can actually, you know, mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that it works is the top level, which is why we call it the lighthouse, is the guiding light. And that is who you are and or want to be in seven words or less. We don't believe in in mission and vision statements, they're useless. They don't actually affect day-to-day -day behavior in an organization because no one can remember them. Um, then below that, you have your values. That's really the how you, you will operate within the world. Below that, you have your focus areas. And again, you're ideally looking at, other people may refer to these as your strategic imperatives. You're ideally looking at no more than three mm -hmm. because if, when you move beyond that, the likelihood of you actually being successful goes down significantly. Below the focus areas, you have barometers. Those would be the metrics. And they are aligned with your focus areas and tell you how you're progressing. Those are the strategic levels of the lighthouse. The tactical levels of the lighthouse that list are go below the barometers are projects and then tasks below that. Tasks are the smallest activity level of an organization done by individuals or small groups. Projects tend to be done within a department. So the way that it works is in our work, very, very often what we do is we stay focused on the strategic level. So again, that's guiding light, values, focus areas, and barometers. The organizations often then take that and do some tactical planning exercises to determine projects and tasks. We do do tactical planning and uh, as well as coaching around around tactical planning when it's appropriate mm -hmm. uh, for a client. But that's really the discipline. If you if you don't complete the lighthouse, you will not have that alignment from the smallest everyday tasks all the way back up to your guiding light. So when you choose those projects, you are choosing projects that will move you forward in terms of achieving your barometers, which allows you to be successful in your focus areas, which is done by the way that you live out your values, which allows you to achieve that very highest level objective and vision of who you are, which is expressed by your guiding light. Mm -hmm. How do you, how would you say your methodology is different from, let's say, traction or one of those other alternatives that are out there? Um, there are so many that are out there. Uh, and many of them are great. Uh, it's just a matter of, I do not, um, I do not say, as much as it would probably be a great sales script thing, um, I do not say that our methodology of the Lighthouse methodology is the best that's out there. I do say that whatever it is you choose in terms of your methodology should at least be built on the same principles that ours is built built mm -hmm. on. and. Certain methodologies, traction is is a is a great one. Are mm -hmm. and essentially the pillars that they should be built on are collaboration, speed, and results. This should not be a big, long, drawn out exercise. It should be focused on what actually will show up and affects the behavior of your organization and whatever methodology you use, you need to arrive there collaboratively. I had a client at one point um, come to me and they were asking about strategic planning and they said, well, we've got a really good strategic plan, mm -hmm. um, but we don't understand why, uh, why we keep losing our top level executives. And I just started by asking, okay, well, how how was your strategic plan created? And this company was, uh, they were doing about a quarter billion a year in business. Um, they had scaled quite quickly. They, they reached that over about a five year period from startup to, to that. And they said, well, um, 
our uh, chairman and our CEO uh, lock themselves in a boardroom for three days and write the strategic plan and then share it with the team. And I said, well, that's, that would be why, <laughs> because they, they were, they were trying to attract and retain very skilled executives yet they were not involving those skilled executives in their strategic planning process. They were just dictating to them the how of their work. And there has to be an aspect of, of your process that allows for collaboration. Mm -hmm. Which was kind of my next question too, because I think the biggest struggle most entrepreneurs have, I mean, obviously the company that you're talking about is fairly large and you might have a much larger team size, right? And it's a lot harder to do uh, maybe just incorporating everybody into that. But how do you recommend practically getting the vision? I know you have a very strong opinion on mission and vision. Uh, and right, basically, how do you get that across to the organization, especially when, you know, size may not allow you to have uh, everyone to be inc included in, you know, strategic planning session? Yeah. And um, don't get me wrong. I am not at all suggesting that you include absolutely everyone in your strategic planning. Mm -hmm. In fact, that is highly inappropriate and you will get really poor outcomes if you do. Mm -hmm. The only people that should be involved in your strategic planning are those that um, are also very, uh, are also um, uh, engaged in the implementation of the plan. If you have, if you have other people in the room that are voicing opinions and so on that don't really have skin in the game, for example, you will massively agitate the individuals that are in the session that do. It's like, well, that's all well and good for Mary to say this or that, but it doesn't, it doesn't really affect her. Um, I normally say that the, um, the, actual strategic planning workshop strategy is is mostly done at the executive at the executive and board level again depending on how your your organization is mm -hmm. set up however what you can do is create opportunities for all of the voices of your in your organization to have a chance to be heard, to have a chance to actually inform that process. And especially now that can be done very, very quickly and inexpensively and easily through uh, digital surveys, town halls, stuff like that. Just as long as you don't do them as BS PR exercises. And that is what very often happens. It's no, 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 no. The people need to have it validated that, first of all, that their concerns, that their thoughts, that their ideas were actually collected, were actually looked at, and somehow informed your strategic planning process. So depending on the size, complexity of, of your organization, there are many different ways that you can involve everyone, if that's what you desire in your strategic planning process, in ways that are appropriate and don't cause the process to bog down or not happen in the first place. Awesome. Well, for the remaining moments, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you and uh, some of the lessons you've learned in the process of building your company. Obviously, you've built some creative organizations and now you're running a very strategic you know, consulting organization, right? Uh, I'm sure you, there's been some lessons you learned in, in building such organizations. What are some big lessons you learned in the process of uh, building uh, those organizations? I'll, I'll just focus on one big lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and the largest lesson that I've learned, um, I've, I've had a lot of different uh, companies over the years. Um, I still presently run three different companies. And... Uh, the main one that I've learned, especially for those of us that are, are entrepreneurs, is you need it, it needs to be connected to a source of significant passion for you. This goes back to 
one of your first questions about your why, right? And um, Simon Sinek's book and work um, around Start With Why resonated more for me than almost any other business text that I've read. And I'm a very, very avid reader of, uh, uh, especially of, of business, a business strategy and knowing what that is and ensuring that how you go about building your business and how you go about sustaining its success never becomes disconnected from your why that's how you get through the inevitable ups and downs you'll have good years you'll have bad years you'll have problems with certain clients all of that stuff um what gets you through all of that is not losing that thread of that original passion that caused you to start that venture in the first place yeah, and I think sometimes you look at other entrepreneurs and they're running a business that you have no interest in and you wonder like, man, how does he keep doing it, right? And I think it's certainly their why is definitely aligns with whatever the organizations that they're building. Absolutely. It's, it really is at the, the core of how you, you both build and sustain success. Yeah, and I know you touched a little bit about your you're an avid avid reader. Uh, are there any personal development um, practices that you have other than reading uh, to kind of keep your mind sharp and, and to continue to learn? Absolutely. Well, you joked about all the letters after my name. <laughs> um, I really believe in constantly learning. If you are not, um, especially, especially when, when what you do is um, you're an advisor, which is really at, at the core of, of what I do. Um, you need to stay up to date. Beyond that, you need to always be challenging your own thinking. Our methodology is not static. Mm -hmm. we, we discover things all the time that cause us to tweak it or tweak the language, tweak the language a little bit. Um, I really think that I've, I've been fortunate in my life to have known a few people that had achieved mastery at whatever it is they were doing. Um, sometimes those were uh, singers, uh, actors, directors in my previous life. Uh, in this life, it's been, um, uh, you know, certain entrepreneurs um, uh, or, or business executives that you know, have achieved really amazing things. And what I've seen is, is that the, what allows you to achieve mastery is a combination of humility and curiosity. And I would, al I, I would say that the, it's the humility that allows you to maintain your curiosity. And I had this experience a few times where I, when I was younger and I was working with someone who is significantly older than myself, who was a mentor and had, had really achieved kind of that level of mastery and, and what it was they did. And it, it amazed me. And I had this experience more than once that they would sit down and listen to my ideas and engage in genuine open conversation and be like, huh. That's interesting. I've never really thought about that that way. Tell me more about that. And I was so blown away that someone that had achieved that level of success and, as I said, mastery, still approached their work with such openness. And it wasn't until many years later that I came to realize that is the work. And that is, that is how they achieve mastery by being that way, that combination of humility and curiosity. And the curiosity is about constantly challenging your thinking, constantly learning. Um, and uh, that applies as much for you as an individual in terms of your practices. I, 
exercise. I do yoga. I meditate. And these are things that I've actually done for a very, very long time. Um, these, these all contribute to, mm-hmm. um, to what it is you're able to do in your service to other people and organizations. Yeah, you reminded me of someone who actually I had as a guest, uh, and I know I've known him for a little while as well. I don't know if you've never, uh, seen a website called G2Crowd or G2.com, um, no. which is kind of like a review website for software companies and service companies, and pretty, pretty big in the U.S. market. Um, and I'm sure Canadian businesses are listed there as well. And uh, the uh, the founder, who's uh, Godard Abel, he's uh, someone who just described his style. He's very humble and very curious. And when I asked him about his success, and he always points to his team, never takes credit for what he has accomplished. And, and he has some really big accomplishments. I think his first company, Big Machines, was sold to Oracle for like $300 million or something. And then the second company sold to Salesforce, which was called Steel Bricks, for like $2.4 billion. And now he's on wow. his third venture called G2, which I think raised over $100 million in capital, and the company is rapidly growing. And super humble guy, if you ever, if you ever meet him. And so that, that is essentially discuss, you know, what you described, which is kind of the people who mastered it, right? But never really appearing as though if they arrived and always asking, okay, how did you do that? What's the reasoning behind it? And waiting to even talk to you to, to see your, hear your story. Uh, I think that's an incredible, incredible character to be in a leader for sure. Well, and you see those that, that are on the other side and... Some of these individuals have been very successful, um, but it's just, you know, those that sort of have that desire for like guru status or, or something like that. Um, I don't know, honestly, to each their own, but that, that certainly does not attract me to, uh, to people. That is not someone that is, has just decided, nah, this is the way, this is the only way um, that, uh, you know, becomes a zealot for, for example, their, it's always their methodology that they created. Uh, that That's not an individual that I'm interested in collaborating with. Well, certainly not. Uh, obviously, we as entrepreneurs, there's one thing we don't have enough of, which is time. Um, so I'm curious to learn any sort of productivity hacks that you have um, that might help other entrepreneurs to be more productive? Sure. Have a strategic plan. <laughs> it's, it's honestly like you can, you can mess around with your, with your day as much as you want. Mm-hmm. You can try all of the time hacks and you know, time measurement and journaling and all of that stuff as much as you want. If at the higher level you have not made strategic choices about where to put your focus or (laughs) time, uh, you're screwed. So there isn't a productivity hack in the world that can save you if you have not made those higher level strategic decisions, either as an individual or as an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the urgent over the, the important, right? Uh, if you know your strategic goals, then you are not going to just go waste your time on some of the urgent matters that may or may not be, you know, required to touch. And massively speeds up your decision making mm-hmm. because you know, you know the gauntlet of criteria that every decision you make on a daily basis needs to run, and that gauntlet is found within your plan. I do personal strategic plans as well. Mm-hmm. I was actually listening to a, a talk from Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of, uh, I guess he was, I think he's the chairman still of the Alphabet, right? I'm not sure. Um, but he, when someone asked him, I think it was um, Reid Hoffman, I think he was interviewing him, asked him about what he could have done differently. And he said, make decisions faster because he said every day or month lost in taking a decision actually put them, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars behind. Because someone else either took the market or did something that uh, changed the game for them. But importantly, you can't you can't make rapid. uh, Let me actually let me step back on that for for a minute. You can't make responsible or effective rapid decisions at the tactical levels, the tasks or the projects, if you haven't done that thinking at the strategic levels. So it really is. 
knowing, knowing, um, you know, where you are, where you want to go and how, how you want to get there that allows you to inject that speed into your decision-making skipping over that part of the process. Yeah. You can make really, really rapid decisions more often than not. They'll be the wrong ones. Yeah. And also it saves you from the shiny object syndrome, right? You're not going to chase every shiny thing you see because you're, you're going to be very focused on what you want to accomplish based on your plan. Absolutely. So based on, you know, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give your, you know, give your younger self? M give my inner self. Young, younger self. Oh, younger self. Yes. Uh, what advice would I give my younger self? Um, I think the advice I would give my younger self would be to be more patient. Uh, with others, sure, um, but also with myself and, and understand that um, results are important, but there's always a process that allows us to achieve those results. So spend as much time focus on building the right process or plan um, as uh, as moving forward and, and, and trying to get results. Awesome. Well, great note to uh, finish our talk. Well, Chas, I certainly appreciate your time and thank you for sp sharing your wisdom with our audience and wish you all the best with your ventures. Thanks so much, Samuel. Awesome. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.